Hello everybody, welcome back to the channel for another video. Uh, I personally am feeling like crap this morning and I'm extremely hungover and this is because my body is more poorly maintained than a legacy code base. Uh, I don't think I'm going to have any topic specific jokes this morning simply because the 9-11 risk to reward joke ratio is just not there. But uh, yeah, without further ado, let's do another, possibly the last low level design episode in this series, which is going to be the airport control tower. Alrighty, so let's design an air traffic control system. So basically, just to get some background on what this is, in case you're not entirely sure, the entire point of an air traffic tower is basically just to sit there at the airport and tell planes when they're able to do things like land from the airspace, go to the taxi, go to a specific gate, and even when they're able to depart. So just to go ahead and actually write out the requirements of this problem, we're basically going to have the following. A plane is going to basically enter the airspace of our air traffic control tower, and from there, you need permission from the tower to go ahead and land at the arrival plane taxi. From the arrival plane taxi, you need to be able to be assigned a gate, assuming there are even vacant gates, and then when you're at a gate and you want to depart, you again need permission to go to the departing plane taxi, and then from there, you need permission to go ahead and depart. So that's all good and dandy. However, there's also some additional complexity to this problem added by the fact that it's possible that things like the taxis may be completely full and a plane cannot yet enter them, even possibly from the airspace. And the same goes for gates. There may be no gates left at a specific airport. And as a result, they would have to wait in the arrival taxi for a bit before they can actually go to a specific gate. Okay, so let's think conceptually about how we want to go ahead and model a problem like this. Well, basically the way that I've chosen to kind of think about it, and that's how I'm going to pitch it to you guys, is that our air traffic control center is kind of like a server, right? And all of our planes are like different clients. The clients are going ahead and making requests to the server, and in turn the server is going to go ahead and get back to them, saying here's what you need to do now. So in this case, the things that the air traffic control center would do is basically receive a response from the client or the plane saying, I'm ready to move on to the next stage of this pipeline. And the server would basically say, okay. However, it's not actually that simple. As we know, in a client server architecture, at least a traditional REST API, the client will go ahead and ask the server for a response and the server will instantly send one back. However, in this case, that may not always be possible. The reason for that is that we know that there's not always going to be space, right? There, for example, you know, a plane might have just landed and now it's in the arrival taxi and it may want to go to a gate. However, there may be no gates available. So as a result of there being no gates available, what the server, or in this case, our traffic control center might have to do is take that request from a plane saying, I'm ready to kind of go on to the next round, hold on to it, and only once there's actually going to be uh, you know, some amount of readiness or, you know, some empty space for the plane to actually move on to in the pipeline, can the server or our air traffic control center respond back to the plane. So we kind of need this concept of real-time push as well. Our, tro our Basically, our traffic center has to be able to receive messages from planes and also independently send them out, not only when prompted. Okay, so with all of those things considered, let's start thinking about some classes that we want to look at. Um, obviously, one class that's going to help a lot to have is an airplane class. The reason for this is that there is state that an airplane has to follow and also some functionality that they have to be able to perform. So we know basically that we have our airplane class and that can have something like a plane ID. This is useful just for the you know purpose of bookkeeping right in our traffic control center. We want to keep some amount of state with regards to an airplane. Um, we also have our current location. This is useful as kind of keeping track of status, right? So if we're in the departing taxi, uh, if we're at a specific gate and you know right now I have this as a string in reality you would probably want this as an enum or if you're using something like OCaml do some sort of nice pattern matching to kind of go against that status um, and then you also have this boolean ready which truthfully I think I kind of cut out later in the design so it's not overly necessary but it's useful if you just want to keep track of whether the airplane is ready to move on to the next stage of the pipeline then finally we have one method called advance which is effectively just going to take the plane and change it from its current state to the next state in the pipeline one. I'm not going to implement this, but the general gist is, you know, if you call advance and the current state is airspace, for example, then it would go and change the current state to a, a rival taxi. And then, of course, the corresponding getters and setter methods. Okay, so now let's start to actually think about our control tower and the interface that we can go ahead and implement for that. 
Um, as far as I'm concerned, there are really only two main methods that we have to uh, go ahead and implement, but let's go ahead and think about what those will do. So basically the first is going to be actually acknowledging that a plane is ready to move on to the next step. And we can just take in a plane ID and that way, you know, we can keep track of all the planes that we care about. And so, you know, when we acknowledge that a plane is ready, that's great, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that plane is going to move on to the next step. It may be ready to move on to the next step, right? So now we have to consider it for potentially moving on to the next step. However, it may be the case that, you know, just due to the fact that there are a lot of other planes in the airport, we can't go ahead and move it on just yet. And so for that reason, now we have this second method called send advanced message, which we can go ahead and send back to a specific plane via a plane ID. I'm assuming this is basically just going to be like the radio. And then once a plane is going to receive that message, internally it can call its own advanced method to go on to the next stage of the pipeline. I also have an optional payload just because, you know, think of this as like a request where if I were to tell a specific plane, okay, you're going to gate G4, I would need to put that in the payload. Okay, so let's think about some data structures that uh, we actually need to be able to make use of if we're going to implement this problem. Like I mentioned, uh, one of the requirements of this problem is that we kind of have to buffer requests when there's no space for them, right? So if I'm a plane and I'm in the airspace, but I'm not able to land yet, we know that basically once a plane reaches out to the tower and says, I'm ready to land, if it can't land yet, it should probably go in some sort of queue, right? That's the only way to make things fair because otherwise a specific plane could be starved. It would never be able to land um, if we were to use some other heuristic of choosing which plane is next to land. And if a certain plane was in the airspace for too long and unable to land, well, obviously it's just going to run out of gas and crash. So it's very important that we do a kind of first come first serve queue in order to make sure that we're fairly choosing the next plane to move on to the next step of the pipeline uh, when planes do in fact say that they're ready. Uh, if there is, you know, kind of no space available. So here are some places where we should be using queues to make sure that we're choosing fairly which plane moves on when there is a lack of space. Uh, the airspace, the arrival taxi, the actual planes themselves and gates when they say they want to go to the departing taxi. And then actually we don't need a queue for the departing taxi because the second a plane in the departing taxi says, I'm ready to go, well, it should just go ahead and go. And that kind of begins the entire process of the pipeline where once a plane is on the departing taxi and it says, I'm ready to depart, it's going to instantly go and kind of leave the airspace. And then now we can kind of start moving the other planes through the rest of this pipeline, if that makes sense. Okay, so let's actually think about how we might run the controller class. Um, I'm basically just assuming that uh, every kind of instance of the plane is, you know, is able to kind of communicate with this controller. You know, perhaps we pass it in via like a dependency injection or something like that. But just generally, all we're doing is handling all the plane requests to move forward. Uh, the controller is going to be acknowledging the plane ready request. And then within that acknowledge plane ready request method, you're going to see that I will end up actually calling that advanced method to tell planes to move forward. Um, another kind of concern to quickly touch upon is actually going to be multi-threading here. Um, so as you can see, I've kind of have a single threaded loop in the previous slide for the controller to kind of go through all the requests. But then the reality is if we're kind of modeling our airport controller like a server, it means that in reality, we're probably going to be receiving a lot of concurrent requests. And when you have concurrency, it means we have to think about things like locking and our data structures and making sure that they're thread safe so we don't have race conditions. So the example I provided is what if there are two planes in the airspace and they both want to be able to land, but there's not enough space for both of them to land. We need to make sure that um, basically our controller is not reading the, the, like the current buffer for uh, the arrival taxi and saying, okay, both of you are good to land. Because if so, they're gonna both land at the same time. There's not gonna be space for both of them and then they're gonna crash. So that would be an example of a race condition. It's very important that we would use something like locking in order to ensure that there wouldn't be uh, basically race conditions and issues within our airport system. However, at the same time, I think that multi-threading is also kind of beyond the scope of this problem, but perhaps some interviewers might want you to touch upon it. Okay, so this is going to be a long method, and so I ended up writing it out in English just so I could kind of fit it all on one slide. But let's go ahead and run through the process of actually acknowledging a plane ready request. You're going to see that within this method, I call advance plane ID a lot, and keep in mind that that itself is also a complicated method, which I'll touch upon in future slides. So basically, we have this plane ID that uh, we're taking in as a parameter, and the first thing that I'm going to do is assume that our airport traffic controller uses some sort of hash map to actually get the corresponding plane object from that plane ID. After this, we can check basically the plane status, and then from there, decide what action to take. So for example, if the plane is in the departing taxi, like I said, if you're ready to depart, 
and you're in the departing taxi and then you want to depart, you can just go ahead and do that. There's no issues there. You don't have to wait upon anyone else. So basically f from there, we would just say, okay, there's now an additional spot in the departing taxi and we can call advance for that plane. If the plane is at a gate, we first need to check if there are spots available in the departing taxi so that it can move forward. And if there are, basically we have to say, okay, now there's one less spot in the departing taxi. Uh, we have to basically take the gate that the plane used to be at and put it back into a list of available gates to choose for future planes. And then now we can call advance on the plane. And then otherwise, now we have an issue where we have to basically enqueue this plane uh, in a queue of planes that want to go from gates to the departing taxi. So that's easy enough. We can do that. We, plus, we place it in that queue. We don't call advanced plane. Uh, it's a very similar thinking process for when the plane is in the arriving taxi, right? If there are open gates, we can assign one of the gates to it. We can basically say that gate is no longer available. And we can also say there's now an additional spot in the arrival taxi. Then finally, we can also call advance with that plane and pass in the name of the gate to go to. Otherwise, now we have an issue again, uh, there's no space, we're going to have to actually enqueue this plane in the arrival taxi to gate queue. And then finally, if the plane is in the airspace, we have to basically check if there's spots in the arrival taxi. Um, if there are, then we can go ahead and say, okay, now there's one less spot in the arrival taxi because this plane just landed to it. Uh, we can call advance on the plane, but if there are no spots available in the arrival taxi, then we have to put the plane in a queue of planes trying to go from the airspace to the arrival taxi. So from this point on, I basically showed you guys how to enqueue all the planes or when to call advance, but we also have to think about, well, if there are basically planes in the queue, how do they get out of the queue? And this is kind of where this advanced plane ID method comes in. So basically the way that I've chosen to implement this is kind of with recursive logic, right? So every single time you call advance on a specific plane, what I'm going to do is check the status of the plane that you're advancing, right? So let's say that you're calling advance on a plane that was in the departing taxi. Okay, so now we know there's going to be an additional spot in the departing taxi. So what I'm going to do in the actual advance method is now check if there's any elements in that queue trying to go to the departing taxi. And if there are, I'm going to call advance on that first element of the queue. So now you kind of see this recursive functionality. And then I'll say, okay, well, I just called advance on an element from basically the gates. Uh, or a plane that was at the gates and I just called advance on that. So now uh, within our function again advance, I'm going to say, okay, well this plane was at the gates. So now let's check for elements trying to get to the gates from the arrival taxi. And then in turn, I'll call advance again. So you can see that recursively, we're kind of going backwards through that pipeline from the planes that are departing all the way through. And as a result of this, advance is going to allow us to eventually move all of our planes up. Every single time that a plane is advanced, we know that we're going to be reaching out to the actual plane object itself, and the plane object can move from one stage to the next and change its status internally. Okay guys, so that's kind of all uh, there is for this video. It's actually not overly complicated, but it did actually take me a while to kind of get to this solution. So it's definitely not something that's super easy to just kind of code up on the spot. But at the same time, you know, if this kind of client server architecture model stays strong in your head and you see that it's not just an instant request and response, but sometimes you have to respond later, then hopefully this video should make a decent amount of sense. All right, guys, well, I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, it's been fun doing these low-level designs, and I probably have a couple more uh, before I call it a day with these, and then I'll go back to the drawing board on more types of videos to make. But uh, as long as you guys are continuing to enjoy them, I will continue doing them. And uh, yeah, have a great weekend.